Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, I'm Jessa. Welcome to Better Sex. I'm doing this because I think sex is important. We are not living our fullest life, the most fulfilling way we can, if we are not intimately, emotionally, and sexually connected with our partner. So I'm here every week bringing tips, perspectives, experts, ideas, strategies to help you improve your sex life. Enjoy the show. Oh, what a treat for today's episode. I get to talk to Paul Joannides, who wrote The Guide to Getting It On, which I got to tell you is the most recommended book I have in my practice. I probably tell 50 to 75% of my couples to get this book. Read it, read it to each other, get a highlighter out. This is, you know, this is great sex ed. It's a great conversation starter. It is a fabulous resource about sex, really, for any, well, certainly any heterosexual couple, for sure. Because as Paul's going to talk about in the interview, while he started out wanting to be inclusive, he was advised by gay and lesbian bookstore owner, write what you know. It, uh, don't patronize us by thinking you know what we're doing. So anyway, it's a fabulous book, so entertaining and so funny. And it's just such a pleasure to get to talk to him about why did he write it and what's in it and what makes him revise it because we're now on the ninth edition of this book after all these years. Um, he's as funny in person as he, <laughs> as he is in the book. I'll warn you now. I think you're going to have a great time. I hope you enjoy the show. Paul, thank you so much for being with me today. Well, it's my pleasure, and thank you for having me. It really is a treat, because I I think I told you this when I invited you to be on the show, but I probably recommend your book to 75% of my clients. (laughs) So, Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's just so useful, and I know that's part of what I want to talk about today a little further in the conversation, but it's just such a delight to, to get to talk to you about it. Well, thank you. Um, boy, th- things have sure changed in the uh, over the nine editions of that book. <laughs> yeah. So when you know, tell me when when did you first write it, and and why? You know, how did how did you get the idea for this? Financial desperation. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. It was uh, gosh, it was, let's see. First edition went to press in the, uh, 1994 or five, but. Um, I had originally written, um, I was writing a, a book on chemistry for uh, for surfers, and it was on chemistry and physics. I felt that uh, a lot of the books on chemistry and physics in high school were so boring and without personality. And so I, I started to do that and then discovered that high schools don't want any books uh, with personality because they're likely to offend at least one person. Ah. And if you offend at least one person, then hey, it's gone. Yeah. And so, uh, actually, it was about the um, the chemistry of urethane because I thought urethane is a great way to teach chemistry because the molecular structure of urethane, well, depending on what you do to it, urethane is either causes the stretch in a bikini uh, spandex, or um, it can turn out hard like a skateboard wheel which is also made of urethane, and so uh, is, a, is a surfboard core. It just depends on how you treat the urethane chemical, depending on what you get out of it. So I thought that was kind of fun. And people would have fun because, you know, a lot of kids use skateboards. They know skateboard wheels. They know right. bikinis. They, they know bikinis, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, they know, and they know surfboards. But that flopped. And... Um, I was out of money, and I, I figured, God, the, the, probably the third or fifth or tenth book in the series I'd write would be on sex. And then I thought, oh, well, I'll just write the book on sex and get some money, and so I can write the other ones that I really want to write. 
how did how did you I mean, were you a chemist? How did how did you have this whole list of books on such diverse topics? Well, I'm a research psychoanalyst, but I did a lot of uh, hard sciences in college. Okay, okay. In science. So I figured, oh, just, you know, it'll take me a few months. I'll get this book on sex written and then get some money in so I can write the other one. Well, I started to write it, and then I discovered what an amazingly complex subject it is. And uh, it took me probably nine years to finish it. Wow. Okay. And and then by the time I got the first edition ready, uh, or the first, you know, manuscript ready, no publisher would take it. <laughs> okay. They all said, they all said, uh, first of all, it's not enough like The Joy of Sex, because that was the book at the time. And second of all, it's a, they said, it, it's really got a sense of humor, and it's got an edge to it, and no one wants that. They they, they just want, uh, want it to read like Ladies Home Journal. Hmm. And uh, so they, they they wouldn't publish it. And so, and in fact, uh, one, one publisher at St. Martin's Press was, was the liberal publisher at the time. And the editor said, you know, I just went to a, convention in North Carolina, I can assure you not one person in North Carolina will buy this book. Well, the, the book is used in, in three colleges in North Carolina now. It's a yeah, yeah. <laughs> reading. So I, was, I would laugh at that. But uh, So I ended up having to learn about self-publishing, and I published it myself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's how it came to be. People say, why Why did you write a book about sex? I, I, the best way I can figure it out is I think it's probably revenge for eight years in Catholic school. <laughs> How much did the book change in those nine years that you were coming up with that first manuscript? Like, you know, did it turn out differently than you anticipated or? Yeah, very different. Okay. So where did you start and how did it, you know, how did it get to where it got? A lot of tequila. And, and I don't <laughs> drink much, but... <laughs> You know, my wife is always saying to me, God, would you just have something to drink and chill out? Well, I rarely drink. But I found that to write the book, I needed a lot of tequila. Just because you just have to let go of years of negative messages and weird shit and uh, um, just try to try to see through all that. And as a psychoanalyst, I think one of the things that the book did well, it's probably the only thing the book did well, was I wanted it to help with people's anxiety about the subject. Yeah. And so if there's any underlying anything to it, it's really trying to uh, take away anxiety and make it more fun to be able to talk to a partner about the subject. So that's how, you know, over that first nine years, there weren't, weren't the huge changes that there have been since then. Okay. Um, during the first nine years, a phone was still a phone. It was connected to a cord that connected to a wall. Right. There were no iPhones. There were no iPads. There were no you know laptops. That weighed twenty pounds. There was dial-up internet. The, yeah, dial-up internet was the best you got. Yeah. Right. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, porn was still images in Usenet groups. Yeah. Right? There there was no porn hub. Porn had not become the sex educator of every middle school child in the country, right? right? In the world, probably now. People still read. So we processed information differently than we do now. You know, you, you were expected to read books. You know, back then when I was writing, uh, I can remember. God, in, in early 2000, I was writing columns for alternative newspapers, a weekly column. And that's when you still had alternative newspapers. And if you, they wanted at least 1,200 words and no images because images were a pain in the rear for them to print and certainly no color. Yeah. Well, now when I write about sex, I spend more time working on the images right. and the graphics and th than I do on the research. And Heaven help you if you write more than 500 words because no one's going to read it. Right, right, right. It's all pictures. So our whole world has changed dramatically. Um, you know, I've always had to go through with each new edition and look, what, what's the technology change? I would refer to, for some editions, I refer to smartphones. Well, now you use the word smartphone and you sound like an old geezer. It's just <laughs> a phone. 
before I could say videos, uh, but by videos, not YouTube, but I mean, you know, videotapes. Right, right. I caught a few of those. God, heaven help you if you use the word videotape today. Just all sorts of things like that. I mean, there are dozens and dozens that have just changed. And with the first edition, porn, I maybe used the word porn twice, maybe once in the whole book, if that. Now with the ninth edition, I wrote that rewrote the whole book through the eyes of someone whose sex education was from watching Pornhub. Wow. There, there are three chapters on porn. That's a huge change from the first edition. Yeah. So all these things are changing rapidly in our world. Um, it's, it's very fascinating. Got the same genitals, but that's about it. Yeah, I suppose what we do with those doesn't change that much either, right? But it's within the context, the cultural context and the technology, like you're saying. Yes, and how you present sex education, how you write about it. The seventh and eighth editions of my book were almost 1,200 pages. Right. And my my distributor, um, book distributor to the trade, and it used to be to the trade meant all sorts of bookstores. Now to the trade pretty much just means to Amazon. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they said, look, here's the reality. You need to get that book down to 500 pages if you want it to sell. Hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I took 20 years to, dev- to d- develop these chapters. And you want me to cut half the book out? So I started and uh, I got it down to 624 pages. That's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. even still, it's a big book for now. But. You know, they said that that 1,200 page book scares scares people. It's fine for courses, college courses where it's assigned. But you want anyone else to buy a 1,200 page book? Forget it. Hmm. So that's changed as well. So what is it that prompts you to to create each new edition? I mean, do you start as soon as you finish one, you start revising it, or what? Uh, what makes you yeah, look up and say, "Wait, I need a new edition"? Yeah, serious OCD. <laughs> um, I, I haven't done it with this edition because after the ninth edition went to press I've not even looked at it much because uh, the whole world is turning to video so I've yeah. spent the last two years uh, learning how to do you know video animations and and uh, you know, I spent my whole life starting off on a typewriter which you use with your fingers and um, boy that's changed yes uh, but now I'm. It was always print on paper, paper that you could pick up with your hands, and that you could address with a pen or a pencil. Now I'm suddenly dealing with 29 frames in color per second, and it's such a different way of thinking and a different way of viewing the world. So, um, yeah, lots of things have changed. But with each edition, there were just. Times were changing. People were changing. The way we communicated changed. Texting changed everything with couples. Right. So just as soon as I'd get one to press, I felt that it was dated. The minute yeah. I went to press, to me, it was dated. Yeah. Well, do, so will there be a 10th edition at some point, or are you going to move over to video only? Well, there, there might be. I've stopped saying there won't be new editions, because I, I never thought I would live to see the 5th edition. <laughs> You're um, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm 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 pretty pleased with where the ninth edition is right now, and it's really just a year old. So I may actually go two more years before a new edition. Yeah, the book is also used in a lot of college courses, so I need to have it absolutely up to date. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the research, right? So you can't totally abandon print because of that. Right, but it, it's a reason to keep working on new editions. Yeah, to make sure that it's got the latest research. Right. Well, so how much in writing the book in the first place? When you're back in those nine years writing the first edition, how much of that did you already know? How much of it was a research project on something that you know? I mean, how you said the Catholic school upbringing, right? Um, how much of this was your own sort yeah. of ex- exorcism of some of that sex negativity? <laughs> I, I kept. Uh, being startled by how much negativity would, would bubble out wow. uh, from deep recesses. And I'd already been analyzed five days a week for five years. In fact, I, I when I first published the first edition, I, I uh, fortunately, I had a, a very kind and thoughtful and funny uh, 
sweet mate who was a psychoanalyst. He was, um, you know, m- much older than I was. And uh, I became terrified when I almost was about to put the first edition to press because I said, this is about sex and it's encouraging and it's open. And something within me said, that's a very bad thing. I really started to have panic attacks. I never had panic attacks. And uh, he, he started laughing. He, he said, uh, well, I think we need to deal with this uh, our super ego that's inside. I had to go back to analysis just to be able to get the first edition to press because I was afraid that uh, I was doing something evil wow. by publishing it. So, yeah, those, those early negative messages certainly uh, run deep into the soul. But you don't want to, and, and, and what I see so much today in terms of sex educators is uh, so many of them are, they're running with what, whatever early messages they had and just simply doing the opposite instead of saying, what is it that people really need? Hmm. You know, as opposed to, oh gosh, I, I was really gay and uh, uh, now I need to tell everybody that, you know, they need to be gay or they need to be uh, open to being gay instead of saying, no, that's cool for some people. It's mm-hmm. not cool for everybody. But we, we now have sex education, which really isn't about communication or sex education. It's about telling people how to think. Mm-hmm. And that's very sad. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I first took the book to press, as I said, the, the editors of the big publisher said, no, this book has a sense of humor. People can't tolerate that. Well, we've come full circle now. In sex education, you can't have a sense of humor because God help you if you piss off one person yeah use the wrong pronoun right right we've we've become humorless again yeah overly politically correct sort of right yes yeah and uh heaven help you if you try to have sex and you don't have a sense of humor (laughs) (laughs) humor is what gets you through yeah yeah it's gonna be way more handy if you can relax and have some fun for sure yeah (laughs) And, and laugh at the mistakes yeah so uh, this is a sort of a separate thing, but now I keep, did you ever write the chemistry book or, or did, is this t- totally? Never totally, did. Okay. So this has taken over, I, I suppose, everything it's, that you've done. It's become, it, it's gotten its own life. I mean, it's taken over my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So, I yeah. bet. So walk us, walk us through the book. You know, what's, what's inside? What's the tour of sort of what you wanted to, I guess we should just start with the, you know, talk about the latest edition, but what's in there? What I felt was kind of sad about the latest edition is it starts with an apology and an explanation, mm. which you shouldn't have to. But uh, when I was in the middle of writing the book, you know, back then there used to be these wonderful bookstores and there were also chains of gay and lesbian bookstores, which were really cool. And uh, I met with the editors, at, uh, not the editors, the uh, the guys who ran the, the, the managers of uh, this gay and lesbian bookstore chain. And because uh, I, I lived in West Hollywood at the time, which was kind of like a, a gay and lesbian enclave. I mean, my, my wife and I were the only straight couple for several blocks. Hmm. And uh, so I met with them and I said, you know, I, I want this book to be just incredibly inclusive. I want it to be the most inclusive book on sex ever written. And, they, they turned to me and they said, uh, you see that shelf over there? I said, yeah. And they said, that's the shelf we have to dust more than any other shelf in this bookstore. And I said, how come? What, what, what do you mean? What are you saying? And they said, that's the shelf where we put the inclusive books about sex. Hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean there? And they said, okay, take a look at this picture uh, right here that you've got in your book. See this uh, this uh, woman with her lips around this guy's scrotum? I said, yeah. Well, straight couples probably find that to be really sexy, but how many lesbians do you think will buy a book with a picture like that in it? I said, oh, okay. And then, and then they said, take a look at this picture. This guy's got his face between a woman's legs. And look at all these vaginas. Look at all these breasts. Do you really think a gay man is going to buy a how-to book on sex that has these pictures in it? And, and then they said, now, here's a story. When you wake up every morning, do you think about sucking cock? And I said, 
Mm, and it's not the it's not the first thought, not not, not the first ten, not right, the right. first twenty. And they said, "Well, then, if you don't stop trying to patronize us, write what you know and for who you know." Hmm. And they they said, "If you try to write a how-to book on sex for everyone, it will speak to no one." And uh, that was a huge awakening for me as a sex educator because we'd always been had, had this idea that everything has to be inclusive right well it's it is so completely true and that's probably the best advice i ever got uh i was angry about it for a few days but then it, it occurred to me yes that's absolutely true and you look at the source of sex education today is porn okay people don't watch every type of porn you zero in on the kind of porn that turns you on. Right, right. There's no such thing as inclusivity, inclusivity in <laughs> porn. No, that's true. And the same is true with with sex education. And unfortunately, you know, we we, we feel everything has to be inclusive. So that was a that was a huge change for me. And, yeah. And I I tell that story now at the very first part of the book because I'm sick and tired of sex educators saying, well, you don't have you know pictures of um, and, you know, this isn't inclusive. So I tell the story about how I got cured of the inclusivity book. So would you say at this point the guide is for heterosexual couples or people? It's for men who like to have sex with women and women who like to have sex with men. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good to, to have that clarity because I did have that question about the, you know, what we would yeah. refer to as heteronormativity. But I think yeah. But it's interesting. But it's we don't not use that. the term homonormativity. Right. Right. So yeah, heteronormativity is a negative term. Term. It is. It is. But that's not what you're the doing. Word, exactly. Yeah. But we don't use the term homonormativity. Hey, if there's a book on sex for gay men or lesbians, we say, hey, that's great. We never say that's homonormative. Right. Right. Because sex education has again is all about political correctness and and. The gender studies thought police feels that if you are heterosexual, that there you are automatically against gays and lesbians and people who are transgender. Um, and so we have a great deal of negativity in sex education for people who dare to say, you know, hey, I'm a woman and I like to sleep with a guy, uh, or I'm a guy and I like to sleep with women. We assume that somehow that means you're prejudiced against gays and lesbians. Which right. It's right. not the case. Right, right. It's not like you didn't think about inclusivity in writing the book. It's that you made a conscious choice with some of that feedback, right? To write what you know. Absolutely. Which, which is I, totally different. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just get so annoyed with these gender studies students. I, and I want to say look, long before you were born, back when it was dangerous, I had gay roommates. I could get you beat up. <laughs> you know, you don't know from what, with your privileged little world going to Widener or whatever university you're going to, and, you know, trying to tell me what I can and can't think. Yeah. Because you don't know what it was like. You don't know the battles we had to fight for right. people who are gay and lesbian and transgender. Yeah. It's easy now. <laughs> but uh, don't get me going. <laughs> right, right, right. All right. So that's that's the first thing people encounter in the book. Where does where does it go from there? Um, what I try to do is give an idea that, gosh, here here we talk about sex, but we don't even really know how to define sex. It's like, okay, how can how can clothes be sexy? What is a quality about a car that makes it sexy? Uh, why is it that some people will do a particular sex act and think it's wonderfully sexy and other people will think it's gross? So I try to open up the idea that we're not even quite sure what sex is and what it means, yet we use the term a lot. Right. That's what I try to do. And I try as hard as I can to make fun of our stereotypes. Um Pretty, su pretty successfully, I would say. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Because, you know, 
it, it, it doesn't do any good giving anyone a lecture. It's much better to just kind of throw some zingers in and make fun of the way we are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and hopefully get people laughing about the way we are. It's Jessa here, just taking a quick break. Thanks for listening. Are you interested in being a guest on the show? I'm always looking for people with expertise to share that could enrich other people's sex lives. And I'm also interested in hearing from people who have transformed their own intimate relationship and would want to share their story with my listeners. So if you've got something to contribute to the discussion and want to see about being featured on an upcoming episode, please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, and check out the Be a Guest details. You'll find everything you need there. All right, so what's some more of the tour through the book? Well, we then go into what's romance. I have romance is one of the early chapters. Yeah. And I talk about the difference between the kind of romance that advertising wants us to think is romantic, which means spending a crap load of money, versus what's really romantic in a lot of ways, just thoughtfulness and mm-hmm. Uh, those sorts of things. And uh, I try to, and, and then uh, an early chapter is getting naked. Uh, that can be, that can be stressful for some people, for a lot of people. Uh, and what is, what's, you know, and if you're naked together, does it mean you always have to have sex? Is that the time you have sex? Or, you know, so I, I try to talk about things like that. Then we, then uh, we talk about women's genitals and then uh, men's genitals, and hopefully in ways that are kind of uh, bring a smile or a sense of humor. Right. You know, in the entire book, even though when it was twelve hundred pages, and even now there was only one chapter on intercourse, penis and vagina intercourse. Right. Right. You know, that was also very different uh, when it first came out because sex at the time meant penis into a vagina. Yeah. And uh, so I've, I, the book has always been very different in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm sure you have seen changes over the years. What do people bring you now as opposed to what they brought when you first started practicing? Well, I'm I'm newer. I've been in practice about eight years, so I haven't seen the breadth of change that you have. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. So it hasn't been quite as dramatic because, I, you know, porn, all those things were big even in the beginning. Although I guess the technology, uh, you know, even in eight years has changed a lot. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 You mentioned yeah. that the book is used in colleges, but I'm curious, like, who do you think should be reading it? How can, how can it be used besides as a college textbook? Well, I was always pleased when instructors would say it's the one book that students never sell back. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And they they didn't never had to assign them to read the chapters because they'd read them on their own. Um, but uh, you know, it it's not a book that I think you should read from front to end if you don't want to. It's a book you should thumb through it. Yeah. Just kind of see if something catches your eye, or it, it, I, I think it would be a a good book to read with a partner. Um, just because it provides props for you to be able to talk maybe about some things that you've you've not talked about before or you you're afraid to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I definitely have some ideas about this because I like I said I recommend it to probably 3 quarters of my clients. And so I definitely suggest it for people that are lacking in sex education or think they got their education from porn, right? Because I'm surprised how many people even now don't have a, a very good knowledge about sex. Right, even anatomy. You know, uh, an instructor uh, in down in Florida, uh, Lori. I don't know if you have if you've had Lori Mintz on. She, yeah, I did. Lori, I did. Wrote a book about clear. Uh, yeah, she's excellent. Uh, I remember two years ago, or a year or two ago. She, she's, you know, I, we were talking about some things, and she said, I've, "I've got to tell you, I think this is the most ill-informed young generation generation of young adults I have ever taught about sex." She said they're just ill-informed. Yeah. And you would think with all of the access to porn, 
the whole internet. You can look up anything. You can ask anything. It doesn't mean you'll get good information. Right, right. Um, but and maybe that's the problem is there's just so much bad information that never gets uh, proofread or checked. No one ever says, what are your facts there? Porn is misleading. I mean, it's not sex ed, right? It's entertainment. So it's not a great place to learn about how sex really can work. But we don't allow porn ed. Yes. And that's a problem. Right. And I, I get crap from some sex educators when I challenge porn as a source of sex education and say it's a horrible sex educator. Right. And you say, oh, well, you're being porn negative. You're just trying to shame people. No, no, I'm absolutely fine if you watch porn. No problem about that. But let's deal with the reality. It's crappy sex education. Right. It's terrible sex education. Right. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, so, I'm surprised. You know, even in my practice, it's not that it's not only young people that are ill-informed, right? Like I get mm -hmm. a lot of uh, people of all ages, really, who don't have a great knowledge about sex. So, the, you know, I recommend the book for that, you know, just for sex ed. Um, I also use it in the way you were sort of alluding to, to have couples read it together you know, or highlight it or something and talk about what they see and are, do they get ideas about what they might like to try or do or or does it give them language to sort of talk about technique or things that they think they might want, right? Because a lot of people don't, they may not know the stuff or they may not know how to talk about it. So I think it does a great job of that too. What, one of the hardest things for me in writing the book was language. Hmm. When I first, uh, one of the first, you know, I'd worked on it for a couple of years and I, Handed uh, this manuscript of the book, it's, you know, printed on printed paper, <laughs> and uh, it was a couple hundred pages. And I handed it to a friend who was a playwright, and I said, "You know, can you can you take a look at it and tell me what you think?" I was finally ready to show it to someone. And about two weeks later, she handed it back, and I thumbed through it, and there were only about maybe six or seven paragraphs in the whole 200 pages at the time that she had highlighted in yellow. And that was back in the old days when you highlighted in yellow yeah. with a real highlighter, not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I thought to myself, oh, great. She loved it except for those six paragraphs. <laughs> and so she said, oh, no, 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 no. This is a complete and total dog. Oh, wow. And she said, if you read those six paragraphs that I highlighted and you can turn that Make that the whole book. That's the tone the book should have. Oh wow! Then, then you have a winner. Huh? And so I basically had to throw away three years of work. But I knew she, at that point, I I knew she was right. Because those are the ones and that are sassy and funny, and and uh, yeah. they were the ones where I dared, yeah, <laughs> to, <laughs> to have fun. Well, so here's uh, another way I use the book with clients, right? I'll I'll suggest they read it aloud to each other. Because for people that mm. struggle to talk about sex and who have felt uncomfortable and, you know, we just have never had this conversation, it so quickly desensitizes it for them, right? Because you're it's so funny. Oh, wow, that's very kind of you. No, it's it's really to true. If they if they read just a couple of chapters aloud, they're gonna get over this discomfort with talking about body parts and you know, and what you do with them. It's I can I didn't even know what to call body parts. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's such a struggle. And uh, in our culture, it is such a struggle. Right. Uh, boy, I bet as a sex educator, as a sex therapist, that just must be a big pain in the rear for you. On the other hand, it's probably what brings people to your door. Well, absolutely. And I mean, you know, in a therapy, I'm trying to use the language that they use. Although, I, I honestly, I cannot bring myself to say down there. Like, I, I can't. I can't match that, <laughs> but I'll try to reflect whatever language they're using. But your book is such an amazing way for them to to try out, you know, just about every word there is and say it out loud to each other. If they're reading it aloud, it's not their fault. Right. But they end up getting comfortable with the language and then they can choose. How do how do they want to refer to things? How, how are they going to talk? You know, it, it was also I'll tell you something, there's, there's two things that come up. But one thing, my, my wife would always get angry at me, she'd say. You know, you have no trouble making fun of men, men's body parts. It makes it funny and fun to read. But you really hold back when it comes to women. Mm. And I said, yeah, well, because I'm a man, I can make fun of men. It's dangerous when you're a man and you make fun of work. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she said, yeah, we'll get over it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that in the book too. My wife gave me permission, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> so, uh, but she would always call me on that when I was, uh, you know, I'd let loose on that, but uh, right. I'd pull back on them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really fascinating just to be able to just talk about things is so hard. One, one change, a big change I made with this new edition. And you'll you'll probably disagree with this, and I fully understand if you do. In all the prior editions, I would refer to women's genitals as vulva, and mm. I would correct people, and because the vagina is just one part of women's genitals. Right, right. And this edition, I finally started gave up the ghost and said, because people would the, the word vulva is uncomfortable for people to say. They say vagina, and they're cool with that. Yeah. And I thought. I thought to myself, give up the darn ghost, because whenever you say vulva, they say, do you mean the car? <laughs> and the, the important thing, the important thing is, it isn't what you call it. It's that you have a sense of awe and respect, and you want to learn more about it. And it occurred to me, that's the important thing. Stop telling people what they should call it, because that's politically correct. Yeah. Or anatomically correct. If they call it a vagina, big deal. It's how they're using it. So I kind of got over that. I stopped fighting them because I figured after after twenty years, if I haven't won this battle, I'm not going to win it now. Yeah, I, I can um, and, I can appreciate and, your position about that, but I'm not I'm not quite ready to give up. On, like, I'm not giving up on the. Yeah, ball. no, I, <laughs> and I, I I fully understand that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's it's very interesting that way. Yeah. Yeah. So one other one other way to use the book, I just want to say, is I think for teenagers, I've given it to all three of my kids uh, in high school. Oh, that's wonderful. And thank you. I have bought it for their friends. That's very kind. I mean, <laughs> you know, they say, "Wait, mom, share, my friend Robbie needs one too," so I'll send it to him. I mean, I just think it's it's such great education, and teenagers, I think, are ready for this. And in fact, I know my oldest daughter; she just calls it the sex bible, and she has it on her shelf. Um, in college and in fact she went she went to college and you know i'm a sex therapist and her dad is a wine importer and so she shows up at college oh, and she, she's got your book and her dad is sending her wine and the, all of her friends are like who in the world are your parents you know but she, she shared that with <laughs> you know, all these people and i just i would really encourage people with teenagers to give them the book well people originally said why don't you do a, a, a version for teenagers of this book and I thought about it, and I really wrestled with it. And I said, "No, this is a this the book for teenagers." <laughs> absolutely, well, absolutely. I mean, what you're not supposed to talk about masturbation in a book, you, you know? But I said, if I write a book that parents will buy for their teenagers, it's not really a book on sex for teenagers. Right. It's a book to 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 make most parents uh, think that their kids aren't really having sex. Mm. Aren't really interested in sex. You know, we take away these illustrations and we put illustrations that look like they were done in pre-K. Yeah. That's what a book for teenagers would be. And I said, no, this is a book for teenagers. No, it's perfect. So that was a big struggle for a while. Yeah. No, but, I we uh, want we want them to have the real information. And I don't I don't understand why we think everybody has to sort of reinvent the wheel here. It's like let's let's give them what they need to know. Well, you, you know, uh, I'll tell you something that was really shocking to me. Um, I was uh, speaking in North Carolina at a college there. and uh, Someone, a, a woman from the college newspaper called and said, is, is it tr true that she said, uh, what do you think about women masturbating? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, is it okay? And I said, why wouldn't it be? And she said, well, a lot of young women think it's nasty for women to masturbate. I said, well, do they think it's okay for men to masturbate? Well, yeah, it's okay for men to masturbate. And so I thought, oh, this is just North Carolina. <laughs> you know, so I checked with instructors who are using the book in other parts of the country, in some of the most liberal parts of the country. And they said, yep, we're seeing more and more of that. Really? Um, women are, and, and also kind of a disgust with how their genitals look because yeah. they don't look like porn stars. Right, right. And, and I'm thinking, oh, 
God, how did we lose this battle? Well, $2 billion on abstinence-only sex education takes a toll. Yeah. And, uh, and its strange and bizarre cousin, porn, also takes a toll. Right. In a funny way. We've got this two-headed monster when it comes to sex in our culture. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what to say, but that was really sad to hear. Yeah. Why I mean, would a young woman think she couldn't masturbate? It's right. It's nasty to masturbate. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right. So we got the sort of Puritan side of it and then the porn side of it. And, and luckily, your book is right in the middle, right? Right where we need it. Good, good, well, approachable, th- thorough information. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> so give, as, as we get close to wrapping up here, what else have you been doing? What do you want to share? How can people find you? Well, my my website is uh, just guide to the number two and getting dot com guide to getting dot com. Sorry, I'm, I'm outside. It's a lovely day. We are ah. on the coast of Oregon, and we ordinarily don't get lovely days like this. So the dogs are now barking. Oh, that's uh, okay. But uh, uh, so it's just guide and the number two and getting dot com. What else? Well, I just found out that my cheesecake got uh, first place and best of division at the Oregon State Fair. <laughs> so they can come so find you there and taste your cheese. I've got the recipe for it there. <laughs> okay. And uh, my uh, I got another first uh, with star bread, which I got to get the recipe up for. And then my biscotti got second. So right. I got to get that recipe up too. These are important things. Yes, they are. Um, and so, so it's like wine. Uh, good wine and sex are, are a wonderful combination. And, uh, you know, and what, what you about your uh, YouTube, the YouTube videos? I'm, you know, doing my best. And there, uh, you can reach them at guide to getting at dot com, and then click on the video tab. Okay, so the and, link. Uh, I, I, I do my best with them. Um, it's always interesting. You never know when YouTube's going to take one down. Mm. Um, it's uh, kind of uh, always a challenge there. So has, has that happened? But, uh, You've been sort of censored on YouTube. It's happened twice. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah, it's going to happen twice. They they put one of them back up uh, after you know college instructors said, "Hey, we use this in our courses. What okay. are you doing?" <laughs> but it it I've discovered it has nothing to do with whether it's explicit or not. Oh. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, it's just. YouTube is YouTube. Hmm. Um, All right. So they may come or go, but if people are interested in those, they can find them through your website. Yes. They always, they'll always find them there. Cause I gotta say, I just watched the ultimate guide to the clitoris for couples. And I just think that was also fabulous. So that my website as a resource right away. Thank you. That, uh, what people don't understand is that, you know, they say, why don't you turn out a video every week? And then, well, that thing took over 500 hours to do. Wow. <laughs> so it's, it's not easy. Labor um, of love. So, <laughs> yeah. And there's absolutely no money to be made from it. Um, so, yeah, you just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for all your work all over all these years. I'm so glad you, you, just, you needed the money way back then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me on. It, it's just a really a, such a pleasure on this end. Great. Thank you and, so much. And it's, it, it helps me stay current, too. I get <laughs> questions thrown at me. It's important. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, There are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners. 
when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web, and you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.